Good afternoon, everyone joining us. Welcome to all of our viewers on live stream and Facebook. Uh, to those of you now joining us on Zoom, welcome to you as well. Today we have Rebecca Yale returning to the virtual event space, acclaimed travel wedding photographer, and she's going to help us posing large parties. So for those of you wedding photographers or anybody shooting lifestyle and events and you get that 20 person group and you have trouble with it, or if it's a five person group, because people like me even have trouble with that. I have trouble, honestly, with anybody over one. So <laughs> if it's a group over one, I'm having trouble posing it. So Rebecca, I'm gonna be paying attention as well. Welcome back, wonderful to have you back here in the virtual event space. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks so much for having me. And hopefully after this, you won't say that again, because everything <laughs> I'm doing is super easy building blocks that you can use for any scenario. So hopefully you won't be able to say that in an hour. <laughs> Awesome. I got my pen. I'm going to be taking notes. For those of you out there watching, you know the drill. If you do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section. If you're dropping, uh, excuse me, if you're watching us from Facebook or live stream, and if you're joining us here on Zoom, we do have the Q&A. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Rebecca. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me here virtually. Uh, I am wish I was in New York and we could all be together, but I'm happy that we're all socially distant here. Uh, so I'm super excited to talk about how to pose wedding party uh, portraits, which again, like you said, this can be used for any kind of portraits, not just uh, wedding parties. I've had fun doing this uh, for uh, actors, on for bands, like you can do it with family portraits, really anything, because everything that we're talking about today is just composition. So you really can use these for anything, which is super fun. So, um, oh, let's see. There we go. Uh, okay. So the first thing that you want to do when you're styling a large group is pick a style. Uh, you can do both seated or standing. And uh, you don't want to necessarily default into one because it's what's available. You want to think ahead and plan if you want to do a more Vanity Fair style seated like the one on the left. Make sure you have chairs available. This is something the last talk that I did uh, about kind of how to get started in your career. One of the things I talked a lot about was uh, planning ahead and that's one of the things that you want to plan ahead. I have uh, sent many unassisted <laughs> running for the hills uh, on a wedding day when I realized that I want to do, uh, you know, more Vanity Fair style photo like this, then we had no chairs anywhere nearby. And I was like, you have 30 seconds to go find some chairs. Go. Um, not the nicest thing to do to your assistants. Uh, and you don't want everyone else waiting around. So take it um, from my trial and error, plan ahead. Uh, and not every wedding will be the right aesthetic for those seated images. Uh, there, you can, like you see the one on the left, it, it has a more editorial polished feel with the seated, but it's not, you know, the, when we, a lot of people think of these seated ones, we think of a little bit more like fashion forward, not smiling, um, you know, maybe that like Tyra Banks smize thing happening, but you can absolutely still do it with people smiling as you see here but it's just not gonna be the right fit for every wedding. So some of them, you're gonna want that more casual vibe of people standing, like the one on the right, but that doesn't mean at all that it has to feel formal. We call these photos on wedding days the formals. We have the family formals and the wedding party formals, but just because they're formal doesn't mean they have to feel formal. I want my standing photos to have that same editorial feel that my seated ones do, which even though editorial people think of being more posed, it actually ends up looking less. It feels more organic than that traditional photo of like, I felt, I feel, I say it's like the prom photo where it's all bridesmaids on one side and all groomsmen on the other and everyone's standing like really stiff. And it's just that, that feels so old fashioned and it doesn't like, no one looks like they're having fun. I want my wedding photos to look like people are having fun. So we are going to dive in and start with the standing and talk about how you can make those fun and still feeling editorial. So you can see in all four of these examples that 
the bridesmaids and groomsmen are mixed up on both sides. Uh, it's not that traditional like prom photo that I was talking about. You can see that there's a bunch of little subgroupings happening and you can see that people are turned in different directions. So that's what we're going to talk about and I will show you how I start posing these. Um, so these methods can be used um, for small groups or big groups, as you were mentioning at the beginning. Um, the one on the right, uh, this was a wedding in Italy that just had two bridesmaids and two groomsmen. Uh, the one on the left, we have four and four. And it's the exact same techniques that I'm using for four people, five people versus like 40 people, which will show um, a couple that I had to do that size later. Uh, and really the trick here to making these look good are those little groupings, which you'll see um, a little bit more um, clearly in these larger photos. Uh, so when I'm posing these, I always start with the bride and groom first. So I always put them right there in the middle and then I build out from there. And this is something that took me a really long time to gain the confidence uh, to talk to the wedding parties properly about. And it's something that my students ask me all the time when I'm teaching of how, like, how do you know where to get started? And I'm a really visual person and I'm really tactile. Like I'm the person who wants to like pick things up and and move it. I can't really see things in my head until I make them. And I was really, I thought that that was a bad thing for a really long time. And I was a little embarrassed by it. And I felt nervous and that I looked unprofessional moving people around. So if I would put people into their pose and I didn't like something, I was really, I was like, oh God, they're going to think like I'm a fraud and I don't know what I'm doing. And I realized after a couple of years, like, no, that's just how I work. So when people, when I'm doing a photo like this and people ask me, where do I go? I'm like, you just got to get in there and then I'm going to move you around. And there's nothing wrong with that. You say it with enough confidence and you project enough confidence. And if you then start taking these great photos and build a track record, your clients and their friends are going to be so excited to be in these photos that they're actually going to find it. It's not unprofessional. It's the opposite. Like if you move them around and you tell them how to pose a little bit, they're just going to get more and more excited because they know what you're capable of and they're so excited to be part of an image that looks like this. I have never taken a Vanity Fair style photo without 90% of the wedding party being super excited and like chatting with each other the entire time. So like being like, we're going to look like movie stars. Like it's a, it's a fun thing. And even if I'm like, oh no, you know what? I need to switch you guys and move your leg like this. And mm, no, that didn't work. Move it back. And that used to make me really nervous. But now I actually, I've flipped the narrative in my head and I see it as a point of confidence. Um, so when I'm posing something like this, I will sometimes just tell them like, I'll get in there. Sometimes I'll just start with the bride and groom in the middle and then I'll build them out. So in this case, I well, in all cases, I usually put on either side of the bride and groom, either their uh, maid of honor and best man or siblings, just depending on the family dynamic um, for, and sometimes they're the same. Um, so for this one, I've got the bride sister right next to her and the groom sister right next to him. And then the next things that I place are where I want people in groups of two and groups of n or not groups but just solo and you don't want it to be like I don't like to do um, girl boy girl boy girl boy it's that same kind of promy thing again and it gets really stripy especially in an image like this where you have these dark suits and then light dresses it'll like look like a keyboard it will be a very uh, jarring thing for our eyes to look at we want our eyes to always flow through a frame in a nice way so the darker objects in this frame are the boys dark suits so I paired two of them together and then the other two guys I spread out and then you can see um, I had one group of pairings of the ladies and then the bride and her sister is also kind of another lady pairing uh, together. Uh, and the other thing you want to pay attention to with these is how you position them towards each other or away from each other. And these little, um, like kind of think of it like a zigzag um, of like, you know, you fold a piece of paper and it gets you that nice little zigzag. That's how I want these to be. I feel like people 
try to line everyone up in such a straight line. And that's, that would never happen in real life. You want these photos to feel like everyone was maybe just standing around and you were like, Hey, everyone look at me and smile. And they just happen to look perfect. And yes, there's a lot of actual intent that goes into it, but it, it looks effortless. And that's always my goal with your, with your, with my wedding photos. And that's, anyone should set a goal going into their photo of what they want it to look like. Because I say you can't throw a target at a dartboard if you don't have a dartboard. If you don't know what that bullseye is, how are you going to take it? So you should always have an intent of what you want your image to look like, and then you can go from there. Um, so you can see in this image too, uh, I have these little groupings and I have people turned in different directions. So I have the bride and groom in the middle, and then I've got only here one grouping of two guys next to each other, because in this one, I have a groomsman next to the groom. So that's another little guy grouping there. And then you can see, I have the two groupings of the women as two and two, uh, and the one on the left, they're both turned in and the one on the right, they're actually turned in towards each other and you can see how some of the guys are turned in a little bit more and some of them are turned uh, straight and when I say that I'm talking about shoulders and kind of uh, your hips um, I'll often say to people like square yourself like directly to the camera uh, and that's um, the groomsman behind the groom there in the middle that kind of has the blue line through his face right now um, you can see he's like basically straight on um, you still you don't want someone to look like super stiff like a robot so you want to like maybe have them bend a leg so their weight is shifted a tiny bit and they just feel a little bit more relaxed um but you can see how some of the guys have that like straight to camera and some of the others are a little bit more turned and that again just helps it feel a little bit more dynamic it's a little more visual interest it's some layering it's a lot like texture our eyes just we love layers uh, so that's what you're creating and it's just a more natural feel um, so now when we get to really large groups, like this is where those techniques become really important because your eye can just get completely lost in a frame like this. Um, so again, I start with the bride and the groom in the middle, and then you can see my groupings of the two ladies. Uh, so I have the bride and, um, her maid of honor next to her. Um, this actually, this is this couple's anniversary. This was a year ago today. So happy anniversary to Rachel and Ben. Uh, but the, uh, two girls on the left, I have them turned into each other, and same with the two girls on the right, and then the other girls I kind of sporadically put in. I have a little family grouping on the right. It's always nice, uh, especially when you have these larger groups and don't really know where to start, uh, to ask the bride and groom in advance, or bride and bride and groom and groom in advance. Um, are there family members uh, in here? You know, a lot of times the flower girls or ring bearers are um, nieces or nephews. So are there parents in the wedding party? Because you want to make sure you put them together. Uh, is there anyone dating in the wedding party? Or like an even more important question, is there any exes in the wedding party? Because I have had a bunch of those and I'm sure that uh, other people out there have had that too, where, uh, you know, you put a bridesmaid next to a groomsman and uh, there's some bad blood between them and it gets real real awkward real fast so knowing that information ahead of time can really help you I always take uh, crib notes during uh, my uh, pre-wedding sessions with my couples uh, so I can keep that in mind as I'm posing very very important skill <laughs> um, so what's really nice with the standing ones as well that you can't do as easy uh, as easily with the sitting ones is going from still images to images with movement so you can see in this one uh, everyone's in black so so it's not quite as obvious as some of the others, but we've got that same uh, movement going on of the groupings of the women here. Uh, you can see on the right, I had the two girls kind of uh, hook their arms through the groomsmen there, which is always a nice thing to do as well. Um, any of these moments of connections and layering looks really nice. In some of the other photos, I had girls like placing their hand on someone's shoulder. Um, any of those little things that connect people to each other is really nice for our eyes because it helps it flow through the image. Um, so an image like this, we can really easily, easily go from that still one to the movement one of having them walk towards me, which I love. Like this was one of my favorite images of a wedding party from last year, just a super fun moment. Um, and it's the same um, with this grouping uh, in Virginia. Um, you know, love this 
more formal photo of everyone together, but this one was my real favorite of everyone walking and just happy and looking at each other. Um, so that's a really nice thing of doing those standing is you can transition very quickly into uh, that other frame. Um, so now we'll talk about seated, which I know this is the one that most people um, are probably here for and uh, find to be a little bit more challenging. And it's that same like, where do I start feeling uh, that I was talking about before with the standing ones. And same as that, you just got to start putting people in there. I, I often am just like, get in there and I'm going to move you around. Uh, I tend to pull up anywhere from four to six seats. I think in all of these we've got four and I will often put the chairs a little back to back with each other. You can see like in the lower left um, that we have the people sitting are back to back. Um, the one above it on the left, um, the girls on the right are back to back, the um, groomsmen and bridesmaids sitting on the left, she's turned a little bit more and he's a little straighter. And that's something I usually do. I'll place the bride and the groom and then I'll place the chairs and then I'll sit people down and then I'll start to bring in other people. And I often will switch who I have seated. Um, if I want someone sitting all the way on the floor, um, like in that bottom left one, I'll ask, um, do I have a bridesmaid who will volunteer? And I try to find either a clean spot or I'll put something down that she can sit on because you know we don't want to stain their dresses. Like no one, no one's gonna be happy with that. Um, but I always just ask like, who's gonna be a good sport and do this? And there's usually um, one or two girls who are excited to do it. Um, and if there's none, then I'm never gonna force someone to sit on the floor like we should be nice to our to our wedding parties um, they could be future clients uh, so that's how I decide who's on the floor how I decide who's seated is often random but once they're seated uh, unless you know one of the bridesmaids or groomsmen is like I really don't want to sit or like you know I'm gonna be inappropriate like my dress will be too low cut or the slit or something will be inappropriate when I sit like obviously I listen to that too um, but it's a little harder to look uh, chic, I'd say, um, or and for men, just comfortable seated than it is standing. So sometimes I'll sit a guy down and he will um, look like uh, that ramrod, like, oh God, do I look okay? Like trying to keep his posture right. And, it and I try to get them to relax. So you can see um, on the top right, I had uh, him cross his leg over, um, which, you know, looks much more comfortable in the bottom one there on the right. They're both leaning forward um, onto their legs, which is something I do all the time. That's a really nice technique, but sometimes you tell guys to do that and they're like this and you're like, you know what? You're, you know, you're so tall. I'm going to switch you. Like, you know, you always want to keep it positive. You never want to be like, you look real awkward. So I'm going to move you to the back. You just want to say to, to the guy who's, you know, doing that, like, oh, like you look awesome, but you know what? I think you're going to look better, like with hair, like, you know, blame it on hair color, blame it on eye color, whatever you want. Um, you just want to keep, you want to always keep everything positive while you're moving people around. So they stay excited. Um, okay. So there are two uh, main tricks to creating uh, these um, seated standing portraits. Uh, and the first is having different levels. Uh, so our eyes really like, we, most of us already know the rule of thirds uh, or rule of odds, we like things in triplicate. Uh, so we, our eyes really like looking at things with these three levels. So the first level here, and I'll flip back so you can see the image again a little bit more clearly. Uh, the first image, is, or the first level, sorry, is uh, the standing, and then we have people seated in chairs, and then our third level is that awesome bridesmaid who agreed to sit on the floor. Uh, and this photo uh, actually won the range rangefinder um, prize for posing like seven years ago and uh or six years ago I can't remember when they got married but it's um i think that it's comes down to these basic compositional elements so the first is these three uh and the second is triangles triangles and pyramids are something that our eyes love to look at they have been used for centuries and centuries um, by the greatest artists of all time uh, to 
organize their images. And these triangles, I mean, I, I drew three, but you can also see the whole, the whole grouping itself is a bit like a triangle that would lead up to the top of that window back there. Uh, and I, I feel like this is uh, those games that, you know, you play um, in those books in doctor's offices when you were a kid. And it's like, how many triangles can you find in the photo? Like you could keep drawing so many triangles within here. Uh, but that those triangles organize the shape. So our eyes know how to travel through the whole frame. There's a journey. They can start somewhere. They can stop somewhere. They can take in everything. And it doesn't feel chaotic. And like I said, that's something that artists have been doing for centuries. Um, we've got a uh, David and a Poussin uh, on the top and a uh, Annie Leibovitz photo on the bottom here. And there's so much happening in these images, but there's a reason that it's a Vanity Fair cover and there's a reason that these two images above like hang in the Louvre and it's because they are well organized. There are so many triangles for our eyes to look at. So even though there's so much going on, they actually don't feel chaotic to us. We can, like there's a reason they're masterpieces uh, and Annie Leibovitz knows how to do that really well. And that's these, you know, young Hollywood uh, covers that she's famous for doing of these large groups of people. If you, you know, really analyze them and break them down they're all about these little groupings and our eyes just love those little groupings so it's all about the triangles um, so with a medium-sized group um, like I will do the same as we did for the standing all about those triangles uh, so you can see the entire group kind of forms one uh, oops, one big triangle there um, but we've got all of these little sub triangles within and like I said I can't um like i i can't pre-visualize this like i i have an idea in my head that i want it to I want it to look like this and i've picked this location and that stuff i do pre-visualize i know i want the mood of this photo but i'm not going to know exactly like you go here and you go here and you go there um that's just not the way my brain works uh so i just start to put people in and then i move them and again like stay confident stay upbeat stay complimentary and they're going to be excited to move for you um so where these tools really come into handy are these large group portraits that's where you really want to organize your frame or it's just going to feel like chaos and there's no way that the like you're going to look at it and like you're like oh and want to leave like your eye just is going to bounce out real quickly and i know that all sounds really silly but this is all happening in like near microseconds your your brain um is looking at things and interpreting them before you actually realize you are so by creating interesting shapes and organ or organizing your frame it's a lot more pleasant for the viewer and they will spend more time looking at it um, so for oops, for this large group um, you can see the entire thing kind of creates one big triangle uh, and then there's all of these little triangles throughout so I have uh, a triangle of the bride and groom in the middle and the people seated on either side kind of come into this nice triangle shape and then two triangles that flock it on either side steps are a really nice way if you don't have access to chairs that you can still create that third level. So you can see I have people on a bunch of different levels of the steps and on uh, some are seated on like those two um, like terraces, I guess, that have the uh, lions on them. Uh, and you can see I have people on different levels on each level. So there are some people who are seated on the bottom and there's some people who are standing on the bottom and um, creating, again, that like zigzag that I was talking about keeps our eye engaged and interested and moving throughout the whole frame. Um, and just like I did with the standing ones, I'm organizing it so I have subgroupings of colors and of the men versus the women. So uh, you can see I have the two girls um, on the left, which there's a little bit of space between them because I wanted that lion to show through. And then I have this other grouping of three um, that are kind of 
in a swish shape there and the same on the other side. Uh, and then I have um, to add some balance, the um, beautiful bridesmaid on her own there on the right. And she had um, all these uh, girls had different silhouettes in their dresses uh, and she had this beautiful A-line skirt. So while she is one versus the two on the other side by spreading out her skirt a little and turning her to the side, it actually um, has like a similar, similar visual weight um, to the uh, silhouette of the other dresses. Um, and it's still very flattering. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to like purposely make anyone look larger in the frame. Um, she still looks lovely. Uh, but it's just by pulling out that skirt, she takes up a little bit more um, of the green color real estate. And it also mimics the greenery uh, in the topiary trees behind them, which our eyes really love repetition and pattern. Uh, so, um, I wanted to show you guys an example of having the bride and groom sit. Um, this was a really fun um, bride that had this great cathedral length veil and wanted to, um, you know, really show it off in a dramatic way. Uh, so I started with uh, her and the groom seated and pulled it out. And then it was all about making sure that this felt balanced. Uh, so you can see that I have this great triangle. Um, that's happening kind of in the middle, smaller, and there's an inverted triangle above them. And then the two sides um, next to them are both kind of these pyramid shapes. Um, and then even smaller, you could, it's that same, like you can draw so many triangles. Um, I have these groupings of uh, three people. Um, there's a lot of these little groupings of three people and what I talked about before of finding that connection when they're standing, um, you can see um, the woman on the far, the bridesmaid on the far left, how she has her hand wrapped around the groomsman who's seated. Uh, and uh, some of the bridesmaids are, you know, kind of leaning on each other a little bit. Um, the bridesmaids in the back on the left have their arm hooked through um, the groomsmen. And you don't want everything to be too symmetrical. Our eyes really like balance, but balance and counterbalance don't necessarily mean exact, don't mean symmetry. Um, you can have visual echoes and um, or I'll show you in a sec. I'm skipping ahead. Um, <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, yeah, there's my upside down triangle um, and the groupings. Um, yeah, so here, this is um, what I was getting to. Uh, so when you have these different colored dresses and you have bright colors in here, you want to create balance um, and visual harmony, but you don't need to create symmetry. So this red dress was a very bold color here. So that was kind of the first thing I wanted to place because I knew that our eye was gonna be pulled to her. Uh, so I had her a little bit more central. Uh, so your eye wasn't being pulled to one side of the frame. Um, and then we had a um, great balance of the bridesmaids in different color dresses but the, and then different colored bouquets. So there were these nice, when I talk about balance and counterbalance, we have the larger purple and then of the dress, and then we have the smaller purple of that orchid bouquet. Uh, and I have it on both sides. So we have that balance, same with the yellow. Um, so on that side, I had the purple being larger. On this side, I have the yellow being larger and then the yellow bouquet on the other. So that's kind of how you can create these balances and counterbalances that end up balancing each other out, but it's not um, like quite so symmetrical. Like you don't want to create like a stripe because um, that's just more, bo that's boring to look at. Um, no one wants that. Uh, so you want to always think of um, how you can play with those colors. Um, same with the gray. Um, I wanted to balance out the blue suits and the gray suits. Um, 
and uh, create these um, kind of colorful diagonals. So you can see how the girls all kind of follow those diagonal lines, which again, our eyes really like to look at. Um, and if you want to do movement with an image like this, it's still absolutely doable. Um, I love the fun Vanity Fair kind of photo on the left, um, but the one on the right is actually what ran as a full page in the Martha Stewart annual edition that's um, still on newsstands right now. Um, that was the opener for this um, eight page um, spread, which was amazing for this super fun wedding in Sri Lanka. So you can see, you can kind of see the empty chairs behind them. Um, and I think I'm like kind of walking into a fountain actually as I was taking this. Um, I was like backed up all the way against a fountain um, as I was uh, shooting the one on the left. So uh, as I had them walk towards me, I was, I think literally in the fountain, um, but you do what you gotta do to get the shot, right guys? Um, so you can absolutely still get that seated that seated photo and the movement um, in the next one. Um, and the key to it is just to make sure everyone's having fun. You don't want like anyone awkwardly in the background staring at you being like either annoyed or like, am I doing this right? Um, you just want everyone to feel like they're in the moment. Um, so keep, uh, I'm gonna go one step further with the color coordination uh, and talk about how I group when I have um, darker colors and lighter colors. Um, so here, everyone was kind of in these shades of blue, except for the bride and her sister were in like, white and kind of champagne color and then the groom and his uh, little brother were in um, these dark blue suits so i kind of put them all in the center of the frame and then used everyone else to balance out on either side so i have the uh three guys on the left um kind of grouped together creating um a slightly darker uh shape there um, with the dark gray tie and the dark gray jacket. And then on the right, um, bright colors can actually have just as much visual weight as um, something dark in our frame. So the girl that I have in the very front there in the kind of brighter pattern dress, that's actually something that's going like we, our eyes really like patterns. Our brains work a lot like birds. We like sparkly things. We like bright, we like shiny. So we're like attracted right to it. Um, so she actually balances out in a really nice way, the darker suits. Um, so, and then um, more of these fun triangles. Uh, you can see how um, everyone kind of forms one triangle together. And then on the left, those four is one little group. And on the right, therefore, is another little group um, that um, by having them back to back and then the girl in the middle, it just creates um, a nice shape for our eye to look on. And there's no, uh, there's no right or wrong with these, you know, like the girl could have been moved a little bit more to the girl seated could have been moved a little more to the center and it still would have worked well. Um, you just want to make sure that everyone in your frame looks happy, that they look confident in where they're seated, and that there's a path for the eye to travel on and you're not getting stuck or lost anywhere um, or feeling um, chaotic. You want it to just feel like a pleasant journey through the frame. Um, so I want to show an example with a little bit more spacing for this one. So this is another, um, like I talked about with the stairs, um, this was shot uh, on the front steps of a chateau in France. I'm up on a ladder, so I'm shooting at them instead of up on them, um, which another important thing of planning ahead, um, had to make sure I had a ladder on hand because otherwise it would have been like a very unflattering angle shooting up on everybody. Uh, so here you can see, um, that... I wanted to show the um, the top of the door here because it was such a beautiful detail. If I had just shot down, I would have just showed more of the steps, which weren't you know the interesting part of the frame here. Uh, so to be able to go wide enough to be able to show that, I had to space people out a little bit more. Otherwise, we would have had everyone kind of crammed into the middle of the frame, and then a lot of empty space on either side um, for the horizontal of this image. Um, so by spreading them out a little bit, I was able to accommodate that. Um, and you can see it's just the same triangles being created here. And when you have kids um, in your frame, you let the kids go where they want. Um, I never try to um, stress too much about where I'm going to place them. Um, we just try to get them to um, sit down or 
just be in the frame in the vicinity. Um, having um, bribery on hand is always um, a fun trick for kids. Although check with your check with their parents before you know you give candy to children or anything. Um, but that's um, anything you can do to get them to sit in the in the picture. Um, I don't worry as much about them as I do um, the structure of the other guys. Um, so you can see with the, that structure of the women, I have, um, like I was showing you those diagonals in the previous frame, um, the diagonals of the three women that complement um, the swoop of her uh, beautiful train there. And then I've got the other girls um, on the right. And because we have so much um, heaviness of the white on the left side with her train and the three girls, I've balanced it by having uh, a girl standing on the very end um, with her hand kind of perched on that groomsman, um, which just helps give us some of that balance again. Um, so when, what I was saying with Crete wanting to get that um, window um, in the or door in the previous image, when you want to take a vertical, you have to be careful of about what is in the top of your frame because you don't want it to just feel like boring and empty and like the entire in visual interest is on the bottom of your frame because then just take a horizontal. But often we like to have verticals for Instagram. We like to publications love to have verticals. So if you are going to take a vertical image, pay attention to the height of your frame and is there anything interesting in the top that will make this image um, not feel half empty because no eye is gonna like looking at that. Uh, so um, this grouping, um, you can see how with the seated, um, we we had more uh, bridesmaids than groomsmen, so which happens all the time these days. And we also, you know, we'll get um, bridesmen and um, grooms ladies, I don't know what the proper term are for them. Um, so I like having it mixed up. Um, I have um, a couple that are together on the back right, which again, asking in advance of like who's a couple is always a nice thing. Um, and you can see how I had the girls in the bottom cross their legs, um, which is a nice, you know, these dresses had beautiful um, slits in them and you wanna make sure that people are appropriate, but it's always a nice way to uh, show off their legs. And you're creating these triangles within there um, um, in your foreground and then in the background you want to layer people together uh, so it's not just a straight line back there you can see the bride and groom are a little bit in front uh, and then other people are turned in towards each other and you've got shoulders going in all the different directions um, so yeah see those little groupings back there. Um, so I started uh, the seated presentation by talking about having three levels, but sometimes you just can't. Sometimes um, there's not going to be a girl who wants to sit on the ground. Uh, sometimes um, the ground's just going to be too dirty. Uh, so when that, or cold, this was um, a very cold stone. Uh, so we had two levels and it absolutely worked. Um, it worked particularly well because we had this beautiful trellis where the ceremony took place that we were shooting under. So that created another layer of interest in our frame. Um, but you absolutely can still create these with two levels. It's the same rules as, the, uh, as what I talked about before. You just want to create these little subgroupings and these triangles. Um, so you can see the groupings um, of the girls that I have. Um, you can see in the left, I have them. They're not quite back to back. The um, bridesmaid is turned a little bit and the groom is turned forwards. Um, whereas on the right, um, they're turned in a little bit more towards each other. Um, but it's all these little groupings. It's just visual interest um, that keeps us attracted and intrigued in the frame. Um, so the important things to remember um, is GDLC, which is groupings, directions, levels, and colors. So when you're starting out your frame, that's what you want to think about. What are these subgroupings that you're going to create? And how can you make them into these cool little pyramid shapes? And then 
direction. How are you posing them? Are they turned in towards each other? Are they turned in straight? Uh, and within those groupings, having those multiple directions. And that sometimes I'll just go in there and I'll literally like, I'll move people's shoulders. It's like playing with Barbie dolls. I mean, I right now don't touch anyone. It's COVID times. Um, but when we're back to being a little safer, um, I will go in there and just move people's shoulders. Um, and then how many levels? Pay attention to how the eye is going to flow through that frame. And then within those groupings, uh, think about your colors of where are your colors in the frame, how, where is the eye going to be attracted, and uh, how is that going to create flow in the frame. Um, so yeah, no matter what the situation is, inside, outside, seated or standing, those are the four things you always want to keep in mind to create great, great photos. Um, yeah, and then that's, um, if you guys, uh, that's my website with a lot of more educational fun stuff and um, my Labor Day sale is supposed to start Friday but I started it early for you guys so if anyone wants to learn more. Um, so questions? Thank you again Rebecca. We do have some questions that came in. Um, first question is coming in from another Rebecca on Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. How you doing Rebecca Moss? Um, how long do you spend photographing the bridal party and how many different big group shots do you get during that time? So for the wedding party, I do a mix of, I'll do bridesmaids, groomsmen, and then the full wedding party together. Uh, it depends on the timing of the day. I like to schedule 30 minutes for it. If it's a huge wedding party, um, like the Ashley and Jared one um, that I showed you in front of Rosecliff Manor, um, I like to have a little bit more time. Um, if I know I'm doing a photo like that, I'll try to have 45 minutes for everything which is bridesmaids groomsmen and wedding party and i'll do the breakdowns usually during that too which is um like the bride with each of her girls and the groom with each of his guys um i shoot with a team of three so i always have an assistant and a second shooter so oftentimes when i'm shooting the girls my second shooter is shooting the guys uh so we can shoot something simultaneously um posing a large group photo like that um you really don't want to take more than like 10 minutes to do it because people are going to like start to lose interest and get annoyed. Um, and you, you don't need more time than that, especially if you like do what I do and you're like, get in there and then I'll move you around. Like you're probably going to be able to get it done in like six, seven minutes. Um, it's the wrangling that always takes a lot of time. So it's once you have everyone in there, like you're going to be okay. But you know, you know, groomsmen, they're off at the bar or they lost their boutonniere or like, I don't know. They, they, I don't know what you guys do. They're, um, I mean, bridesmaids can be terrible too. So, um, <laughs> I don't mean to throw boys under the bus. Um, but you always want to pad, uh, your schedule for that. Um, but it really shouldn't take too much time that Ashley and Jared, like huge group shot. That was the promo shot for this talk today. Um, I had probably like six minutes to pose that entire thing because we were we had a really short window to do all the photos um after the ceremony and get them over to people magazine so like you can work quickly <laughs> now as far as as far as the um the group shots uh lucia noticed that all the men's hands were in their pockets is that a posing technique or is that something is that like a go-to for you yeah, absolutely. I usually have either both their hands in their pockets or one hand in and the other kind of dangling. Um, it's a go-to in general. I do it with my family portraits, with the groomsmen alone. Um, hands just are really funny looking in photos. Um, you know, bridesmaids and brides, they get to hold a bouquet. Guys don't have anything to hold. And like when your hands are just like lying there, they kind of look like, I, I say they look like dead fish. Um, they're just like really <laughs> distracting and kind of like floppy looking um, and having it hooked into a pocket or actually in a pocket um, just is a little bit more polished and editorial looking. If you look through like any magazine, any red carpet, you'll see how like most men will, there's like a man red carpet pose, which is how I always pose like guys solo, which is um, one hand in pocket, the other kind of hooked um, with like their weight on their back leg and their front leg bent a little bit. It's so funny, Google it, you'll be like, oh my God, every male celebrity always poses like that and you'll start laughing. Um, but that's kind of how I like, I'll see if I um, can show one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of how the groom is here. Although sometimes it's more like hooked into a pocket. Okay, and I dropped for all of our viewers, um, I did drop the, her, Rebecca's website 
with the Labor Day 30 code, which does expire at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Monday 9-7. Uh, so I did drop that into the chat. So if you look in the chat, uh, you will have access to that code and the website there. And we will get it into the comment section on Facebook as well while Rebecca pulls the image up. Um, yeah, you can see kind of here how Jared has his hand hooked. Um, I was just, and um, the groomsman on the right um, who is standing um, um, with the, like kind of his shoulder square to camera, that's, a, that's kind of the, the Hollywood red carpet pose of like one leg bent. Um, yeah. So you just always want to be really careful with hands. Like you can see the groom has been sitting here um, with his hand on his leg. It feels relaxed and okay. But um, you know, if they're all just like hanging at their sides, um, it's very distracting. Okay. And while we have the image up, we did have a question actually come in uh, um, regarding when working with light. So either indoors or with working with off-camera flash in group settings. Is there any anything you recommend? Do you try to avoid it? Is it something that you you gravitate towards natural light? Yeah. I mean, I, I love natural light. Um, I absolutely have used off-camera flash and on-camera flash um, for these large group photos. Uh, when you're working these large groups um, and you're using artificial light sources um, or natural light that's like very angled um, you want like that's not you know a soft light like this is you want to be really careful of where your shadows are falling you want to make sure that you're lighting um, every person um, I assisted for a photographer um, who did large portraits like this for um, Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair and a bunch of different magazines and I would set up her lights and it would like we a image with this many people could easily um, be like a six or seven light setup um, she liked a little bit more dramatic lighting um, but you want to make sure that you're not um, casting a shadow on anyone's face like next to them um, and that it's kind of even on everybody. Um, so it's absolutely doable. You just um, want to kind of think that through. Uh, I did a uh, group portrait for um, an actress um, a couple years ago uh, that I was supposed to just be taking behind the scenes photos on the uh, set um, for Right, so Hollywood Reporter, some 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 um, industry magazine, and she decided last minute that she wanted to do a photo of um, all of the heads of the different departments, and I didn't bring any lighting with me because I was supposed to just be shooting on set and you know not being intrusive. Um, so I had one flash in my car, and I ran out and grabbed it and put it on and just flashed it against the wall behind me. Luckily, there was a big white wall behind me, which created like a giant softbox effect. Um, so that's, you know, if you're like, you can, you can, you can improvise and make things work with light. Um, you don't, um, you shouldn't default into something. Um, that was me making the best of a bad situation. If you know for a fact that you're going to be doing a group portrait like this indoors, you should try to plan ahead with either bringing a huge reflector so you can do that giant softbox thing. Because if that wall had been red, I would have been in real big trouble um, or have those multiple lights. Okay. And as I'm looking at the, this image that you still have up, um, and, and look at this next question. I'm thinking, I'm like, wow, Lynn really hit the spot right here. How do you address a specific person? So you have a group this size and everyone's good, but you have one person to move. So Lynn's asking, do you memorize people's names or do you say like, hey, you right there, do you have your assistants go over? Yeah, I will, I will say, hey, you, sometimes I will send my assistant over and have, like, um, you know, I probably had my assistant pull that, the dress of the girl on the far right to make sure it was lying properly. Um, a lot of times, like, there is just, like, funniness of you, no, 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 not you, like, you. Um, I, you know, with smaller groups, I do try to remember their names, um, but, and then again, like, I was saying, like, COVID time, like who knows what's going to happen after COVID. I feel like it's going to like, we're all going to be like so afraid of each other. But I, w I am the person who literally like goes up to people and moves them. Like I will like 
like I, it's, it's like Barbie dolls. You're like, like this, like this, like this. I just will move people's <laughs> shoulders, uh, which I hope we can get back to a place where that's like not a weird thing to do. Although maybe that was always a weird thing to do. Um, but I, yeah, I'm not afraid to like run up and actually interact with people. Um, but yeah, I mean, just point. And if the wrong person is like moving, you're like, no, no, no next, like, you're good, stay, <laughs> you know, just, um, stay, again, like, stay confident, stay upbeat, don't act nervous, like, wedding parties, they're, like, uh, it's, like, dogs, you know, they can smell fear, if they, if they smell the fear on you, then, like, you've lost them, like, you gotta, like, fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and Rebecca had another question, if you photograph these, uh, the group shots on digital first, so you can check the setup, or if you just go straight to film. No, I just go straight to film usually. Um, sometimes I'll have, um, a lot of times I don't even have a digital camera on me. Um, I'll have my second shooter uh, jump in and uh, I mean, my assistant always has it like right next to me. But often what I'll do just for the sake of time is I'll just step to the side and my second shooter will jump in and take a photo um, of this. Not so I can check it. Um, it's just so I can have, I do um, next day previews for my clients. Uh, I mean, this wedding was, um, I did, I had to edit the entire wedding the next morning for People Magazine, which is good fun. Um, but uh, <laughs> usually I just will do like a next day edit of like 10 photos or so. But anyone who follows me on Instagram, you'll see um, I have, uh, I always post on my stories the next day which is so nice like my clients are like they love it they share it I've been doing it since my very first wedding I cannot recommend doing it enough like your clients are if you know if they ask their friends to keep their phones away during the ceremony or the rest of the party they're not going to have photos or if they don't and they do have them they're not going to look good in them so it's so exciting for them to get these photos and this is often one of my favorites so I nine times out of ten will have my second shooter just jump in real quick um, and take it and then I go seamlessly back into it. Um, when you're starting with these posing and large groups, um, I would suggest, you know, maybe take one quickly digital or even on your iPhone um, when you take it when you take a big thing and make it small, it's the thumbnail rule for anyone who's heard me talk about, um, I'm going to spill my water. So I'm going to put that down. We were talking about camera <laughs> before. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not going to spill my water on camera. Um, so if anyone's heard me talk about flat lays, when you take something big and make it smaller, you're, you know, boiling it down to the composition and you can see it a lot better. So it's a lot harder for our eyes to see composition of something in front of us like this. But if, you know, you turn it into an LCD size screen, then all of a sudden, and you'll be able to recognize more if something isn't working. Um, so, you know, when you're starting out with this, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Again, just project confidence. Um, and for what I was starting to say before is practice, you know, like don't, wedding days, I, anyone who follows me has heard me say this a million, million, bajillion times, wedding days are the big game. Like we are athletes and you don't run plays for the first time at the big game. You practice, practice, practice. So while yes, you do need to like move people around, the first time you try a photo like this shouldn't be on a wedding day. Like grab a bunch of friends together, grab, I had, I was telling one of my mentees who's like not around people because of COVID, like play with like your kids stuffed animals, like try doing this with stuffed animals. It really doesn't matter. It's about getting those shapes. So practice that and training your brain to see those things. Cause when I'm posing, like I probably, this is a super important thing, actually, like everything I just talked about. And I get asked this about flat lays all the time too, is oh my God, how are you thinking about all of this? How are you being like color, balance, all of it, like triangles, oh my God, that like, like this must take you 30 minutes. No, it, it, it doesn't because all of this is just in my brain. I've been doing it for so long that it's just like, it's, it's visual language is the same as any language. If I start trying to speak French right now, I'm going to be a hot mess and it's going to take me 20 minutes to get out one <laughs> sentence. But eventually if I practice enough, I'm just speaking French. I'm not thinking about it and translating. And that's what my brain has reached with creating images like this. I've done it so much that I'm not like drawing these Masonic shapes over my images while I'm creating them. <laughs> I'm just seeing this feels right or this feels wrong. And that's what, that's what happens when you practice. You literally rewire your brain. It's so cool. Big fan of rewiring your brain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it was amazing as I was watching, I'm thinking how many photographers haven't been exposed to your style or your creative process behind it and they get locked into, okay, 
you the you know the the best man and the maid of honor you guys have to be together in the pictures and when you got into that portion where you're just like you go with the visual and you put what's right in it doesn't matter if this person matches up with this person it's all about the, the vision and i think that was so critical for me and i think it applies to so many different images that you you have to break out of that mold and i think there's a lot of people that are probably stuck in that mold and then they take images that aren't as dynamic as what we're looking at here and it's because they're they're not stacking the pieces in their favor they're just stacking pieces where they think they should be yeah that's something i talk about a ton when you're looking for inspiration don't get stuck on the wedding blogs and the wedding publications like don't like and that's i like i've had to like do social media cleanses myself of like being like you know what i need to close Martha Stewart, I need to stop looking at Style Me Pretty, which like, I love those publications, but if you spend so much time on them, you're just going to create images that look like someone else's. Instead, like, that's why I showed the um, Poussin and David painting at the beginning of this, which um, I did a talk right around this time last year um, in person in New York with you guys, um, which feels like forever ago. Um, but I showed those photos then too, um, not just talking about, um, Kind of these large group portraits but with any photos it's like you like whether it's just a bride and groom whether it's just a bride whether it's a flower like these triangles and these shapes apply to everything so try to look outside of our niche in the wedding world and get inspiration from painting get inspiration from architecture get inspiration from food like our design is design and composition applies to everything so you you can you know if you start like you're gonna start seeing triangles everywhere it's gonna be super fun <laughs> um, you're gonna start driving down the street and like drawing them um, it's it's the same <laughs> principles that I use to pose that a painter is using to organize like even Van Gogh or you know um, Matisse like someone who's career like Kandinsky like um, Jackson Pollock like even chaos like it's all about composition at the end of the day. We had a question from Bassey. Um, would you use the GDLC for corporate shots? And if so, how would you achieve that? Yeah, I think, I mean, the GDLC could be used for any, like it's, it's not, um, it's not prescriptive of like, must turn people this way, this way, this way. It's just, these are all things you should think about. So yeah, you should be thinking about that for anything really. Um, but don't see it as prescriptive. Don't be like, okay, I have to do these two turned in here and I have to do that. Like, no, you want to see like, does this girl have a slit in her dress that I want to show off? Or like, did this girl spill wine on her dress and I want to turn her this way? <laughs> Cause we've all been there too. Um, you know, you want to, every situation is different. Um, or like, God, wrinkles. Like I, I'm sure other people um, listening in have dealt with like wrinkled bridesmaids dresses. And you're like, I know I'm going to be in Photoshop for hours. So I'm just going to turn you and hide it with your bouquet. Like every situation is different. Um, but for corporate images, it depends on the mood. That's, you know, the first slide that I showed was pick a style. And I talked about intent that like you know you can't throw that dart if you don't have a dartboard if you don't know where that bullseye is so if you, you know you're hired for corporate headshots what is this corporation is it a law firm or is it a fashion magazine is it um you know a group of like 20 year old like cool young women in jeans or is it a bunch of like you know kind of formal eye bankers like that's going to be such a different photo so yeah you want to keep in mind all of those things but your intent and what you're saying and conveying about your subject is going to be super different um so you know how casually i have someone seated um or leaning on each other will be different um depending on what message i'm trying to convey which is like at the end of the day talk to your clients whether they're corporate clients whether they're branding clients clients or a bride and groom like talk to them about what they want and what they like so you can convey that for them wonderful and we had a, a couple people asking about settings um mm -hmm. in particular you, what aperture you're shooting at for ensuring that you have enough depth of field in the large groups and if you have to go wide are you worried about any distortion on the edges of the photos 
Yeah, so I try to shoot these whenever possible um, with my, I'm shooting usually on a Contax, um, which is medium format. So an 80 on a Contax is about a 50 regular uh, or 35 millimeter <laughs> regular. Uh, so I try to shoot them with that as much as I can. So I am, so I'm not getting, um, you know, the wide angle distortion, but sometimes you just have to shoot with wide. Um, the photo, um, it the yeah this one um that i was literally like i told you guys i was backed up against a fountain um i could not get farther back um without like really just like wading into water um which i didn't want to do um so i put on a wider angle lens here and you can you can tell especially in like the cropped version of it um that you know this was taken on um a well, I think it was a 45 on my contact, so it's kind of like a 35 um, on a 35 millimeter. Um, so I try not to do the wide angle, but when you have to, you just, I try to shoot a little bit wider and then I can compress it a little bit in Photoshop so I'm not, or in Lightroom, so I'm not getting that weird warping. Um, and by shooting a little bit wider, like I always try to nail my compositions in frame as much as possible. Um, you know, I always think of the like rough edge brag negative that the photographers used to do back in the day where they would like show the edges of their negatives and their prints so they could be like, look, I nailed it in camera. I'm like, I always want to do that. But uh, if I'm in an unfortunate situation that I'm having to use um, a lens I don't want to, I will shoot a little wider so I can um, compress it and crop in and not get that like weird warping. Um, and for uh, f-stop, um, I'm usually, it again, it depends on what lens because, you know, a, a 70 to 200 2.8 is a different depth of field than a 24 millimeter 2.8. So like you got to know your equipment and your lenses and like what difference that makes. Um, if I'm on like a 35 millimeter, I can get away at f4 and have like ev like have three layers of people like tack sharp on my 80. Absolutely not. Um, and it depends on how far away I am from them. So I'm usually I'd say like around a 5.6 um, for like those big layered shots, um, but yeah, you don't, um, you don't want in these photos to have a ton of like soft, creamy bokeh, like, and have people out of focus. Like, especially in these, like people want to see their faces. They want to see their friends' faces. Like 50 years, like these photos are going to be on someone's, you know, wall 50 years from now. And they don't want to be like, <laughs> trying to like wipe away. I'm like, what does that person look like? You know, and the one on the right, this is probably at 2.8 um, on my 80. And like, that's where like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, it's focusing on the couple, but the formal photo, get everyone's face. Just like, don't mess around. <laughs> Crank it up to eight if you're worried. <laughs> Definitely. That's a that's a great point also in talking about the, the difference in just the physics of lenses, um, how it's not just about the f-stop, it's also about the equipment you're using and the compression and how far you are from your subjects and how far, you know, the stacking is in the, in the group. So it's definitely, for those of you watching, don't just look at the f-stop, look at the, in, you know, the entirety of the situation. Um, and... What? If that's a new concept to anyone, like, again, what I was saying, practice, like, play around at home. Like, a lot of us are still kind of, like, in quarantine mode. Like, shoot anything. Shoot a cup on your desk. Like, it doesn't have to be a person. If you have your quarantining with people, shoot a person. Um, but really, like, you the like, exact same location, shoot at the exact same f-stop um, using all the lenses that you have in your closet. And see how different it is at each f-stop and then like upload them all into your Lightroom and like make a comparison chart and mind-blowing um yeah I remember in high school when like I realized that and it was um I felt very silly that I hadn't before and I was like oh my god this is gonna change my life <laughs> uh, <laughs> if any of you had that realization yay <laughs> <laughs> it was funny before when you were talking about like with the stuffed animals it's like yeah i've used my son's toys and stuffed animals for for oh practice Absolutely. we've all done it i think every parent has, has definitely done it but yeah when you get bored at home it's like you got to use whatever you have to use even if you have to stack fruits on a uh, on a cutting board Totally. I mean, shape is shape is shape. Composition is composition. It doesn't matter what you're shooting that for anyone who's, you know, stuck at home right now and is like, I don't know how to light a big group portrait. 
light all your fruit. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> like totally. it's just, you're just teaching yourself and, you know, maybe shoot it digital. So you're not like throwing away money on film. Um, Cause that's also the other thing that like, people like, I like this question drives me nuts. So people are like, how I shoot light with film. And I'm like the same way you shoot it with digital guys. Practice. It would be funny. Imagine uh, wedding photography went back to film only and you'd see how the market would clear out or how it would change. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a lot of us still shooting um, a good amount of film. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, look, there is no better test of your skill as a photographer than shooting a one time only make or break event like a wedding on film that's yeah but like think of how many i mean digital is such a small fraction of like the timeline of photography and people have been shooting weddings for a really long time like it's i don't know, I know. Well, it's funny. It's like we do have that digital, that digitalized mentality now. Like there wasn't photography before the early two thousands, and it's like, and not, and it, or, or that like people were only taking like these horrible finger painting looking images. And it's like you look at some of the, you know, I always refer to like the Olympics, you know, where it's like people were still shooting these incredibly high frame rate images of you know quickly, you know, fast moving athletes and getting tack sharp images way before these highly advanced cameras now so like, um dr harold edgerton invented his strobe flash like what in the like 19 oh god i'm gonna totally mess it up but like a good 60 plus 70 plus years ago like edward boybridge like his freezing of action and how that led to cinema like yeah people like we get so spoiled by digital and forget like what has been happening in film for so many years that like I talk a lot about um the Henri Cartier-Bresson like decisive moment and how that's you know what we should all be trying to achieve in our images that was film <laughs> that famous image of like the guy jumping over <laughs> the ladder that's film <laughs> you can still get that just like that's people ask me all the time like wait how do you do a recessional on film and I'm like say what you do it on digital like go practice I used to do wildlife photography and I would when I was still living in New York I would go out with my 500 millimeter and I would photograph birds in Prospect Park until like I couldn't hold up my lens anymore because my arms hurt too much and that's how I learned to nail focus like go shoot your dog go shoot a bird in your backyard um with a camera not you know <laughs> well it's like you it's like you said probably 20 30 times already practice 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 it's, yeah, it's because it becomes you have to. and then you you literally rewire your brain like for anyone who's like not studied cognitive behavioral therapy at all like this is not like fluffy science this is real you can literally rewire your brain the exact same way you learn a language you can learn to recognize composition and your brain just tells you like decisive moment decisive moment click the shutter <laughs> um yeah you don't need to think about all of this if you train yourself to start thinking about it it eventually just becomes intuitive Totally. Well, Rebecca, it's always a pleasure to have you on. It's always beautiful images and a, a different look, a uh, different angle of insight on the <laughs> images. But before I let you go, we did have a question from Camilla um, asking about the, if you're only selling the flat lake courses right now. No, I'm selling all of my courses right now. Uh, I am going to be shutting down my entire store except for the flat lay, so that there might be some confusion on that um, October 1st because I am relaunching. I'm super excited. I'm making these two gigantic master classes that's like everything you ever wanted to know about being a wedding photographer and so much of what we just talked about like everything i talk about of training your brain it's the study of semiotics it's like how our brains work and how we interpret imagery and that's the basis of how I shoot and how I try to teach people. So like I said to you at the beginning, like hopefully now, like once you learn things, you can't unlearn them. So like never again will you look at a situation and be like, where do I start? Now you're just gonna like make triangles and start seeing them everywhere you go. <laughs> uh, it's confirmation bias, but in a good way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm creating these two gigantic masterclasses that will be launching in the next couple months. Um, and the courses that I have on my website right now are going to be integrated into those courses with a ton more information. Um, so so you can wait to get them then, or if you want to get your hands on them now um, and get them before they're no longer available a la carte, go do it quickly. And um, yeah, awesome big Labor Day sale. So I hope you guys enjoy it.
Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Rebecca. As I said before, always such a pleasure. Thank you to all of our viewers who tune in. And Rebecca, I'm sure we'll be seeing you shortly. It's only a matter of time before you're back. Ho hopefully it's in person next yeah. time. I miss New York. I miss you guys. The Superstore is amazing for anyone who's not been into it. Go. It's amazing. Yes, <laughs> so although New York right now is not New York. It's not the same. But hopefully soon everything will be back. We'll get you back upstairs on the second floor and we'll, we'll do this Love live. It's safer than LA right now, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you again, Rebecca. Have a wonderful afternoon. And to the rest of you, thank you again for tuning in to another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you all next time.